Um, so if you guys, if you folks don't have any questions, I think what I'll do is just start lecturing on some more about property to charge. I want to say something about uh, the Xerox machine. Here's an illustration of the Xerox machine, the photocopier. Just want to say something about how it works. In the Xerox machine, you have a, uh, a drum, electrostatic drum, and it has a, a coating on it made of selenium, and it's photoconductive, which means that when you shine light on it, it'll conduct. The drum is, the selenium is uh, negatively charged. Okay, so, so selenium is negatively charged. When you shine light on it, then the, uh, the charge actually will go into the drum. The drum is a conductor itself. So when, when, when it conducts, the negative charge in the selenium will go into the drum. It's grounded, basically. So at the top of that uh, Xerox machine, you see a document that's going to be copied. You shine a light on that document. Okay, and that's going to illuminate also the drum. Now, the parts of the document that are already written on, the light won't go through it. The parts of the document that's blank, the light will go through it. And so what will happen is where there is writing on the document, the portions of the drum will not be illuminated. And so the negative ch uh, charge will remain on the drum. And what you do is you, you send toner through there, which is positively charged. The positively charged toner will adhere to the negatively charged selenium because remember, it's not being exposed to light. Okay, so let's say it's a picture of a bird. So, you'll see um, there'll be a dark spot in the image of a bird on the drum. The toner will attach to it because it's positively charged. And then you run a sheet of paper right over the drum, which has a much higher negative charge than the, than the uh, selenium itself. And what will happen is the toner then will attach itself to the sheet of paper. That toner is heated and, and it goes through rollers so that the toner is pressed into the page. And that gives you your image. So basically the Xerox machine uses uh, the properties of charge for it to work. So I want to say a few things about the electric dipole. And so I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to be writing on the board for this. So I'm going to change my display. Can you, can you guys all see the board okay? So I wanna, I wanna talk about the electric dipole. I wanna say a little bit about the physics of the dipole. Now, typically this is covered in chapter 25, but I wanna say a few things about it. Remember, um, when something gets charged, I'm sorry, when you have uh, an insulator and you bring a charge rod next to an insulator, what happens is you're separating the centers of positive charge and negative charge. You get an asymmetric distribution of charge within the molecule. And that's a dipole. What you've done is form a dipole. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the physics of the dipole because it has some important uh, ramifications. Remember that the dipole is a vector defined as P equals Q times L. P is a vector. Q is the charge, the magnitude of the charge on the plus and minus charge within the dipole. 
And L is a vector that goes from a negative charge to the positive charge. The magnitude of L is basically the separation of the centers of positive charge and negative charge. Molecules in which the centers of charge do not coincide are called polar, like water. Water is a polar molecule. And their centers of charge are naturally separated. Those that do, who have these centers of charge coinciding, those are called nonpolar. And of course, those are the materials, you know, you, you can induce a, a dipole by putting a charged object near it. The dipole plays an important role in uh, understanding the effects of electric fields on insulators, like we're doing right now, that's what we're talking about, uh, in microwave ovens, in antenna systems, and in collisions between neutral atoms. The, a lot of times when you do a calculation involving electromagnetic fields, uh, the full expression is complicated, and a lot of times you have to perform integrals of those complicated expressions, and they're very difficult to deal with. And so what, what happens is, if you take the expression for electric field and you expand it into a series, uh, the first term is what you keep because the rest of the terms are small. That first term is called a dipole term because it has the characteristics of a dipole. And that makes the math a lot easier if you, if you, uh, if you can just keep the first term in your series expansion and uh, see all the physics of what's going on just from the first term in your expansion, okay? That's what we call it a dipole term. And so it's used a lot as, as an approximation in physics, physical problems because mathematically a dipole term is easy to handle. It turns out if you put a dipole in a uniform electric field, the dipole will not experience a force. Suppose you have a dipole of saturated picture. Okay, that's the dipole. Let's say I put this dipole in a uniform electric field. Let's say the field points to the right. Now, what does uniform mean? Uniform means it has the same value everywhere in space. Well, I want to know the total force on this thing. Well, I draw a free body diagram. Remember, F is 2 times E. If I have an electric field that points to the right, this charge will also feel a force to the right. Let me do it with that color. But, again, if you do F equals Q times Z, e, E to the right, Q is negative, this force will be the left. If you add this force to this force, you get zero. So if you put a dipole in an electric field that's uniform, the total force on it will be zero. However, the torque on it won't be. When you think about it, let's say I, I calculate the torque on this dipole. And let me sum the torques about the center of the dipole right here. And I use my definition of torque. So this distance is L over, this vector is L over 2. Now, isn't it true that this force, which points this way, is going to cause 
this end of the dipole to want to rotate counterclockwise. And since so the force up here is this way, doesn't this force cause this object to want to rotate counterclockwise with respect to this point? In fact, both of these forces are going to want this thing to rotate counterclockwise. It's the same thing as if I took a square plate like this and I applied a force this way here and I applied a force this way here. Even though those two forces add up to zero, it's going to make this plate rotate. Same thing here. So, even though this thing is, has the sum of the forces is zero, this thing is going to want to rotate. And what will happen is the, the dipole will want to rotate so that L is parallel to E. Is that how those um, mixing rods work in, like, chemistry? Well, you're using a magnetic dipole, right? Oh, okay. And you, you are using a rotating magnetic field. I mean, a magnetic fields uh, are, are called, you know, basic dipole fields. Because, you know, charges, charges are, can, be, can come in, uh, mag, electric charges can be separated, magnetic cannot, right? Magnets all come in dipoles. All magnets have a north pole and a south pole. Even if you cut the magnet in half, okay, when you cut a magnet in half, you'll still have a north pole and a south pole. You'll always have a dipole. Charges are different because you, uh, electric charges are different because you can separate the charges. This would be analogous to the a magnetic dipole this thing. So you talk about something analog analogous. Well, how do you calculate the torque? Torque is R cross F. If I want to calculate the torque due to uh, on this on this object, just think of this as a dumbbell. <laughs> they essentially they're linked together. You can think of this as a massless rod, even though it's not there. They're linked together. Um, so you can have a torque on this thing. Your R here is L over two. So the torque is going to be uh, Q. Or, well, let's write this way: L over two and then on the other one this charge is negative but this all is negative because it's in the opposite direction of this one this is L over 2, that's negative L over 2 or if I say this is L over 2, this is negative L over 2, they're in opposite directions. So, um, when you add this up, you get L plus Q E, you can factor out the Q. And Q times L is the back one. Now, uh, let me just say that this equation is only true for an electric field that's uniform. If the electric field is not uniform, the expression is complicated. I don't want to talk about that here. Okay. It's because it's complicated. We can also talk about the energy stored in that dipole. So you know, I mean, the, this, the magnitude of this, the magnitude of the dipole moment, using the definition of the cross product, is this. Now, um, you have an equation in your textbook in chapter 10. And you might not, you might not remember it, you might have seen it in 205. But in the book, in our textbook, they talk about the work done by a torque. 
And you can write the work done by a torque in this following manner. And this is the angle. I didn't, I didn't draw this picture though. I, this my picture is backwards from what, what I had in, in the slide. Okay. Say that is the angle between uh, L and the electric field. So that's the And what happens is theta decreases. So that means my d theta is negative. And so this is minus p times e and sine of theta d theta. And then I integrate this. Uh, but, but, but if I want to write this in terms of du, The work done by a conservative force is minus the change in potential energy. And then du Now I can integrate this then. If I integrate this, well, what is that? What is the integral sine of theta? It's minus the cosine of theta, right? So if I integrate this, I get u final. U initial is basically your, is, comes from the constant of integration, right? Um, I'm going to get I should really drop all these bars, but P times E times cosine of theta final minus cosine of theta initial. So that's the energy stored. However, uh, typically what we do is we let if we, we let theta initial equals 90 and say U initial equals zero. If u initial is 90, then theta, uh, u initial is 0 by definition. Remember, potential energy is always defined to within a constant, so I have to define where my 0 is, so I define it to be 0 at 90 degrees. And so what that does, then, I, I get the following. Minus p times e. Professor? Yes. What is p? P is the dipole moment that the defined, we define as Q times L. All right? Uh, let me go back a few slides. That's your P. They okay? It's our definition of the dipole moment. I got it. Okay. Can you guys see everything okay on the screen? Yeah, well enough. I mean, it's a little bit blurry, but I don't think that can really be fixed. Yeah, I'm having a problem with my connection. I, let me know if, when, I, when I put the video on YouTube, let me know if that's okay or not. Well, I missed the first five minutes of recording. Uh, 
on my on my uh, video caption. All right. So, but this is that product, right? This minus p dot e. Okay, just a dot product. So that's the energy stored in the dipole. Now you won't see this equation in chapter 25. I'm just covering it now. Um, one question is, what is the torque on electric dipoles that are induced in a non-polar material when it's placed in an external field? All right, we have the equation for the torque. The torque on a dipole in a uniform electric field. But what if I take a material, let's say like, oh, something like a 2 by 4 that's uh, maybe not polar, and I put it in an electric field. What is the torque on all the dipoles? How do I, how do I figure that out? Is it given by... P cross E. But it turns out if you have a material that's nonpolar and you take a rod and you rub it and you bring it near the nonpolar material, the dipoles will automatically be aligned in the direction of the electric field. So that means that th those induced dipoles will not rotate at all because they're already in the direction of the field. And so there actually is no torque on a dipole that's formed in non-polar in non material because once they're formed, they're formed in the direction of the field. They won't, they won't rotate. On the other hand, a water molecule is different because in the water molecule, the dipoles are there already. They have random orientations. And what they want to do is when you, when you put a charge near those dipoles, they're going to want to rotate in the direction, towards the direction of the electric field produced by the charged object. So this, in this picture you see there, that dipole wants to rotate so that the positive charge is pointing forward and the negative charge is pointing backward. The dipole will want to be aligned with the electric field. So that'll rotate. In fact, that, in that particular case, what it'll do is it'll oscillate about the direction of the electric field because what'll happen is uh, it's going to speed up as it rotates. It'll pass the uh, equilibrium position and then want to come back. It'll just oscillate back and forth. Okay. That dipole wants to align itself with the electric field, as opposed to a nonpolar molecule when it's formed, it's already in the direction of the electric field. By the way, before I go on, it would be nice for you to see a, a nice demonstration that I, sh I haven't shown you guys this yet. Uh, I'm going to show you the attraction between a charged object and an uncharged object. I'm going to make this thing rotate just to show how uh, uh, how this idea works. So I'm going to set things up. Here. Let me change my. I got to move my camera. Hold on a second. I'll do it with my software. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to balance, I don't know if you guys can see it, I'm going to balance uh, the 2x4 on this, on this uh, little dish. This is the hardest part of the demo.
Okay, so I've balanced the 2x4 on the dish. It's uncharged. I'm not, I'm not doing any tricks, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to charge this rod up at first. I think I did something with the can last week. I'm going to charge it up with fur. It's not real fur. And then I'm going to put it right in front of the rod. You can see it rotates. Let's see if I can bring it back. Going too fast. So the rod was charged, the wood wood block was not, and I'm making it rotate. You're inducing a dipole in the wood? So I'm inducing a dipole in the block of wood. So I take this. This rod, I'm sorry, I take this PVC rod and I charge it. When I bring it by the block of wood, I'm separating the positive and negative charge in the block of wood. And when I do that, then the positive charge will be very near the rod that I have used. And so I'm causing an attractive force. The effect is not as strong because I'm, I'm losing charge to the atmosphere. Let me recharge. Okay. Is everyone okay with that? So when you do it, you know, when you take a balloon rub it on your head and let it stick to the wall, the same idea. You're polarizing charge in the material so that the charge uh, that's similar to the rod stays as far away from it as possible. And the opposite charge is as close as possible to the charge rod. And then you have a force of attraction. And that's why I can I can make this object rotate. And it's a pretty heavy, pretty pretty heavy object. I was able to get it to rotate. Okay. Let me adjust my camera here. Next question is, suppose you have an electric dipole in a field that's not uniform. Let's pretend the field varies, but it varies in a well-behaved manner. In other words, I, the functional form of the electric field in space has a nice is a nice function. It's not discontinuous or any bizarre weird, weird function. Okay, let's say it's a well-behaved function. Can we calculate the force on the dipole? And I'm going to make the math easy. Let's just say that the electric field points in the x direction. Okay. Let's pretend that the electric field points in the x direction. And the dipole is already oriented in the x-direction. Let's say this is the negative charge. This is the positive charge. This is L. 
Now, in reality, in reality, that, that was a tiny number. Yeah, that, that was a tiny number. It's a real small number. Um, since the field is not uniform, the field here and the field here will be different. So, let me write this as the field at location X. And, and let's uh, let's let them let's take the length of this vector. Let me just call it delta x for now. Let me just call the length of that delta vector delta x. So then the field here is the field at x plus delta x. So I'm going to calculate the total force on this guy. Well, you know that force is Q times Z. And if I drew a free body diagram, uh, there's a force here in this direction. And then there's a force in this direction here. And the lengths of those two vectors are different. And in fact, the force on this side, on this object, is going to be Q times E at X plus delta X. The force on this guy is going to be negative Q E of X, where E is, is a function of X, whatever that X is. So that's the total force. I'm going to write it into the dipole moment. I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by delta x. Well, what's Q times delta x? Well, it's the magnitude of the, the dipole moment. So that's my expression. But, but you know, delta x is really small. And so what I want to do is take the limit as delta x goes to zero. What does that get me? If I take the limit of this as delta x goes to zero, what does that give you? Um, you learned this at the beginning of Calc 1. But this it's e at delta x, uh, x plus delta x minus e at delta x divided by delta x. You take the limit as this goes to, as this goes to zero. How do you define a derivative? Isn't that the definition of derivative? Right? Go back and, and go back to Calc one and look at what the definition of derivative is, called the difference quotient. Okay? You take a limit as delta x goes to zero, you have a derivative. And that's what that is. Now, I, I, I chose this particular example because the math is easy. If, if this dipole was oriented 
at some angle, then you would have a component of the force in the x direction and a component in the y direction. And if you had an electric field that was that had some arbitrary orientation, this thing is complicated. I might show it to you next week. Okay, I might show it to you next week. I don't want to show it to you today. This is probably too much information. Okay. Um, one of the interesting things about charges, uh, Coulomb's law, what we've learned so far in this, in this uh, is that there was an experiment that indirectly uh, verified Coulomb's law. Hold on a second, let me make an adjustment here. Somebody's going to focus on this blurry. I'm not sure why. Hmm. Okay. I apologize for it being blurry today. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Anyway, there was an experiment by Rutherford, which indirectly uh, verified um, Coulomb's law. And he was really interested in what, what is an atom made up of? This was at a time we really didn't know anything about the atom. It was around 1910, before quantum uh, theory. And so what, what uh, uh, Rutherford did is uh, he sent x-rays onto a uh, lead foil He basically scattered, I'm sorry, he sent uh, rays onto a gold foil and watch how the, uh, they're scattered. Oops. Okay, he was looking at the scattering of uh, Particles off gold foil. At the time, the model was thought of um, the model of the atom was basically the electrons that were embedded in a fluid of positive charge. They call it the plum pudding model. And so the atom, the atom was neutral, which were correct, but you know how, how it was structured, they didn't understand. So you had these electrons just basically in a fluid of positive charge. That was the model at the time. And it's called the Thomson model. And he, he wanted to test it. So he sent alpha rays onto a gold foil. And he measured how they were scattered. He expected that the alpha rays would be scattered every, in every direction, but he found that they were not. He found that a lot of the, the uh, scattered alpha rays were scattered backwards as if it hit a solid object. And so he measured how the alpha rays were dis distributed and then he modeled it. He, he developed a model to describe how the alpha rays were distributed. And he used Coulomb's law in his model. And when he used Coulomb's law, to describe his model. Um, his model worked. Of course, the model assumed that the atom consisted of a center of positive charge. And he applied Coulomb's law. So two things happened there. He verified Coulomb's law and he showed that the atom was basically consist of a center of positive charge. And so this revolutionized how we thought about the atom. This was 1910. But around 1913, 1914, Bohr came up with the first model, a good model for the atom. But without these results, Bohr would never be able to make uh, his model. Okay, so I thought it's an interesting thing that this 
he inadvertently was able to verify Newton's second law. I'm sorry, Coulomb's law. Sorry. Do you have any questions regarding uh, the lab or? Any concerns? No questions? No. Uh, uh, regarding procedure or anything. So so what I so so what I need you, you guys to do is make sure you build the electroscope and the electrophorus and make the video for me. Like I said, the video or it could be two videos, whatever. But you know, based on grading on, did you do it? Okay, that's really all I'm grading on. Okay, make sure that when you sh when you make the video, I see your face. In other words, you holding the apparatus, and just show that it works. Charge up the electrophorus, and see if you can pick up paper, you know, small pieces of paper with it. Okay. Or you can at least make the paper move when you hover the electrophorus over it. Are we okay so far? Um, so the first video is uh, just like showing it how we built it and then sh like demonstrating that it works. Yeah, basically you want to, yeah, you want to just demonstrate that it works. Okay. So, you. I, you know, I, I hope it's not, it's, I'm, I'm expecting about a total, a total of one minute in video. No more than that. But if you want to go on, you can, I guess. If you want to make it longer, you can. I, I, I'm, I, the idea is not to, I, I don't want to make it time consuming. I'm just, I just want to make sure that you've reached a point where you built this, so you're not, you know, you built this apparatus and now you can, you can complete the, the rest of the experiment. Okay, that's the only reason why I have this assignment. I just want to make sure you built it so you don't build these at the last minute for, for, your, for the lab. Okay. That way it gives you a series of time timelines to c complete your lab. Are we okay? If we don't have, if you don't have any questions. I'm good. You good? Everybody else good? Don't, you know, email me, contact me if you have questions. Okay. All right. So, um, We'll see you. In, well, actually, I, we have a few minutes. Do you have questions on the homework? Because we have, what, 10 minutes. Do you have questions on the homework? Uh, you know, I only, get to, I only get to contact you twice a week, so. Okay, if not, then if you have, you're struggling at number nine? Okay. Okay, cool. Um, which part of number nine? Let me let me open up weather sign real quick. Oh, let's see. Okay, let's look at part A. So you have uh, a line of charge along the x-axis from x equals zero to x equals six point uh, one eight, and its charge distribution is non-uniform. And you want to calculate the the total charge in terms of lambda naught, and then you want to figure out lambda naught. Okay, so I'll go through it. That's fine. Okay, let me let me uh, so let me do one A. So now I'm going to make it so it's hard to see the uh, the web assign. So you can see me. Well, everything looks. I apologize if it was blurry. Okay.
So here's a rod. And I'm going to use my own dog. Let me just say the length of the rod is L. And let's say lambda is equal to uh, what, what lambda, uh, lambda not times x. <coughs> I want to write an expression for the total charge here. And that little piece I'm going to make that piece as small as possible. I'm going to make that dq as small as possible. So dq is lambda dx because the element of length along the x-axis is dx. Okay. So if this is my expression, my dq. And now I want to write the total charge within this rod. Well, the total charge then, if I integrate, I integrate over the whole length of the rod, right? If each piece has this much charge on it, then the total charge is going to be the sum of the charge on this piece, the sum of the charge on this piece, actually the sum of the charges, of, the sum of all those little charges that make up the rod. So the integral of dq gives you q, and that's the integral from 0 to L. And what is that? Uh, In your case, you put in wherever your L is. And you write your answer in terms of lambda naught, that's it. Okay, yeah, it's not that hard. You're right, it's, it's, it's not that hard, but just understanding what it means the first time you see something like that is kind of confusing. And so the next thing is, if I know this number, can I solve for that? And the answer is yes. If I know Q is lambda naught, L squared over 2, then lambda naught is 2 cubed over L squared. Okay. And this whole exercise is basically doing exactly the same thing. Part A and B are the same thing, except the geometries are different. And this is designed to help you to do the problems with the electric fields. Because I think the DQ is probably the hardest thing students have, have trouble with. And then the R hat. Those are the two biggest issues students have uh, trouble with. Okay, other questions? Maybe I should leave it like this, sorry. No other questions, concerns? Okay. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to actually leave, I guess. But, you know, I, my concern is, you know, especially since we're online, we only meet on Monday and Friday. And if you have a question, you got to ask somebody, okay. Uh, this is a, a hard topic. I know it's a hard topic, a hard unit. Actually, I do have a question, Professor. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I mean, it's more of a personal, like, so on the homework, I already did five problems, and it was on the other, the other homework, because you made another class for it. So do you want me to just redo it, or should I finish this one? Just finish that one. Okay. Can you still see it, or? I'll be able to see it. Once, once uh, you start on it in Canvas, uh, I can't delete it. Okay, so you can see it, but it's just, it looks like I'm in, or enrolled in two web assignment classes? Yeah, so what I'm going to do is, when I, when I see how people did the homework, I'm going to, uh, like, you did the old one, and so I'm going to make 
because I think you're, you might be the only, there might be one more student. I'm going to make those assignments only, if you need to, accessible to you. But you, uh, the problem, you, you already paid, did you pay for it or not? Yeah, because I never bought the multi-term access. So I'll make the, those assignments only accessible to you. And so you want me to keep doing the ones in this class or should I swap over to the other one? Well, you already paid for it, right? Well, I, I got into both the classes, I think. It just automatically gave me access to that's the other one. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> okay. That's that's fine. Uh, just use whatever you want. I mean, okay, well, I but you'll be able to see it either way? Yeah, I, I will see it either way. I guess the best thing maybe is to use the second one then. If you got in for free in the, in the second one, use the second one. Because that's okay, what everybody well, else is yeah. going to be using. Okay. So I'll finish this first one and then swap over to the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because then I can just make those other homework assignments inaccessible. They'll be there, but no one can access them. Other questions? Okay, so then I have office hours from 1 to 2 today. And I will be handing out lab equipment after six today, and I'll be there tomorrow. Okay, so um, hopefully I'll see you guys. All right, I will, I'll talk to you uh, maybe either office hours or on Friday. Take care. See ya. All right.